How are we doing? Yeah, how are you doing? Good. Good. All right. <laughs> Just, how are you doing? I'm really well. Yeah. You know, I always enjoy being around realtors, especially KW Plano realtors. Talking about you know some of my favorite subjects. Well, we enjoy being around you. Well, I understand that because I'm a uh, nice guy. Everybody says, "Hey, Bob, what a nice guy!" It's such a uh, and I and and I am, Mister. I, I would agree with that. You good? Yeah. Pardon me? Okay. Yep. And so theoretically, I can slide it up. This thing we do. Mm -hmm. Doing the little thing up and down. Okay. Yep. Theoretically. Theoretically. There are people here who can show me. You know, he's the tech guy. Oh, yeah. The office. I'm the tech guy. You take questions. Ask me and I know where to send you. <laughs> so everybody has the materials from in the back? Get those. Be sure to take good notes for your group. <laughs> okay, uh, so we'll talk about some of the things that you have for the material. There's things that have come up recently, but there are a goodly number of other things that we need to talk about. Um, Zoomers, can you hear me okay? Give me a wave, a thumbs up or something. They're all <laughs> Yeah. Nobody wants to show their hands. All right. Well, I can hear you, Bob. I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, me too. Thank you. Thank you. So one of the first things I'm going to talk about it's, it's actually three things together. It's NAR's clear cooperation. Um, the coming soon status. And our internal listening service within our office. Because these all kind of come together. Uh, you, you've got a couple of pages there. Uh, actually three pages from Texas Realtors 
that talks about the clear cooperation policy. And it's essentially, basic policy is very simple. Uh, if you remember first, that NAR owns all the MLSs. Every MLS is under NAR. And all the rules, uh, Netris, for example, when you pull up the 67 pages of the Netris regulations, those all had to be approved by NAR. For our regional MLS with over 30,000 members, it's actually NAR. And so NAR says that if you take a listing, and what they want you to do is put it in MLS so that all the other subscribers have the benefit of that listing. And we clearly see that as a benefit to the seller, to the agent. The clear cooperation concept comes from some brokers who were wanting to keep it in-house. And it wasn't that they weren't going to share it with all of MLS. They were going to share it with some select people. They basically want to keep it in-house. You hear phrases like pocket listings, those kinds of things. Um, but they were actually marketing it beyond their own brokerage, you know, with select other agents and brokers and people that, you know, they would do business with. And, uh, and Eric says, no, it's wrong. You can't do it. Uh, there is a process, and we'll talk about it in our third set of documents here, where a brokerage can keep something totally in-house. But unless you do that, and there are specific requirements, uh, if you're going to have any public marketing, and you'll see it, it's talked in here, and well, actually, one of the things we've got uh, is a couple of pages from our listing agreement, technical listing agreement, that defines what public marketing is. And it can be anything social media, it can be a sign in the yard, anything that exposes this property to the public beyond your personal brokerage. Um, and NAR says, if you have any public marketing, property has to go in MLS. In fact, you'll see as, as you look at the um, two pages from the listing agreement, that if, even if you start off with it private in-house and somebody does something, including the seller, publicly markets it. Um, he's over at one of his neighbor's friends and having a barbecue. He says, oh, by the way, did you know my house is for sale? Hey, let me give you some information on my house. That's public marketing. When that happens, the broker has one business day to get it in MLS. Mm -hmm. So NAR says, we won't, if you've got a listing, we want you to share with everybody. Everybody has to have that information. We'll talk in a minute how you can keep it within your brokerage, as it were. Um, but that's, that, that's the clear cooperation. You're going to cooperate with everybody. Everybody who's a member of MLS. Uh, you're going to make sure they have that information. Um, any question on that before I go to the coming soon? Coming soon is a status that you may want to put the property in MLS, but there's still some things that need to be done. Maybe they've got to do some more repairs or staging, uh, maybe some title issues. Maybe they're trying to work through a lien or something. Uh, so if you got it coming soon in MLS, that's a coming soon status for 30 days maximum. And during that time frame, there are no showings. While it gets uploaded, uh, Rover.com, it's a limited number of pictures. It doesn't go out to all the sites like it normally would when it's active. Um, many agents who have buyers search for, they go through the coming soon status uh, to find properties that really aren't fully actively on the market yet and they work through the process. So the key restriction on coming soon is no showings, anyone at all. Now, this does not prohibit the seller from entertaining offers. Buyer who's never seen the property. Uh, and in fact, uh, submit an offer. I want it to be good price. Huh? I thought you just made it cooler. Okay. Um, we actually have a form that we give to our seller. If they accept an offer um, before the property is fully on the market, 
and essentially it, it tells them that um, they could in fact almost certainly get more if they fully have it on the market. No guarantees, but probably would. So a seller, even in coming soon, uh, can receive an offer from a buyer and accept it. And a seller could be in the contract uh, with the property that's under coming soon. Nobody's actually seen the property yet. Uh, work through that. Um, of course, once they accept the offer, that now changes from coming soon to active. Maybe active option, depending on the terms of contract. Now, that's the basic concept of the coming soon. What we can't do is really regulate uh, people's behavior. So the seller understands, yeah, I can't, uh, I can't have, I can't show the property, which means you can't have an open house, but they can certainly have a barbecue in their backyard, and invite all their friends over. And isn't it a common courtesy that when you have all your friends come over, you're going to kind of walk through the house? Uh, oh yeah, see that. I mean. People will do what they're, particularly maybe he's got an estate sale. Maybe he's got a garage sale. Maybe he's doing things. People come by and they have conversations. So people do all kinds of things, but uh, the basic concept is coming soon. People are getting called up through showing service or whatever and show the property. So that's a big restriction. Uh, there's also a rule in there because what age we're doing is I felt like they had some really hot, heavy fires and things like that. They would switch from coming soon to active and then want to switch it back to coming soon after they've shown to a few people. Well, if you switch it from coming soon to active, you cannot go back to coming soon for one year. So you can't just, you know, keep bouncing back and forth and working through that. Um, Making it listed. Pardon me? Making a new listing? No. You can't have to go to a new broker. You have to go to a different broker. But you can't go back to, to active, I mean, back to coming soon, unless there's a new owner, or unless it's a new broker, different broker. Same broker can't take it out of coming soon, put it in active, and then put it back in coming soon for one year. So we got that restriction. So you work through that. Um, so, and you, you have in here, uh, this is out of uh, the Netter's rules. And you pack it there where, it, where it's page 14 of the Netra's rules, where it talks about the coming soon status. It has the rules that, that surround that. Now, so the concept that we're dealing with here, you take a listing, you're going to put an MLS. You might decide to start off with coming soon. That's going to be a conversation with the seller. You know, I still got some things to do. Let's get those done first before we fully put it on the market. Work through that. Um, otherwise, you're going to make sure. And, and you really need to educate the seller because the seller understands you can't be talking about it on your Facebook and on your websites and on your things. You can't be doing it because that's going to be public marketing. And it says in the listing agreement that if even the seller does this, then uh, we've got a problem. We've got to take it into put it in MLS and you got one business day to do it. Uh, so when you take this listing, at the very beginning, you've got to decide how we're going to move forward and market this property. We're going to right away, and 99% of the time, the best way is immediately full market. Get it in MLS, go to the websites, do all those kinds of things. You're just doing that right away. Uh, if there are certain circumstances, then you've got some other options. Now, the final option may be that you want to keep it internal. Internal means just our brokerage. Uh, no other AW offices, no other agents in any other AW offices, only ours. So you've got a little packet there. And the first page is internal listing site. And then you've got a certification page and you've got a couple of advisory notices. So the concept here is, and most brokerages out there have this same service within their brokerage. A couple of them who advertise. Uh, on the radio on Saturday afternoons to talk about this. Did everybody see where it's the first page is internal listing site? Real estate, real estate agent advisory. 
Right, I'm going to show you that. It's a bunch of ways into the packet. About halfway through the packet. About halfway through the packet. There are four pages there. The first one says, Felicity Agent Advisory, Internal Listing Site. Everybody see that? We got it? Everybody good? Okay, I need to move it up. Okay. <laughs> um, so you've got a situation where a seller, for any number of reasons, is looking to you to get his property sold internally. But then your investor group with your other agents in our office, uh, maybe it's security reasons, maybe it's didn't want anybody, everybody's brother know to sell the house, whatever the reason is. Um, so you can take the listing and he makes the choice and the listing agreement's not gonna go in MLS. Um, but you, you can make that choice. And all the exposure, there's no sign in the yard, all the exposure is internal. There's no public market here. <laughs> on websites, on social media, on anything. Um, and the second page here, you know, the first page kind of explains here's, here's what it is, here's what you have to have as you work through the process. Uh, and for the buyers, you're going to be exposed to the property. It tells you what's required. You'll be in a buyer record agreement, one of our agents. Uh, they've signed off on the confidential child agreement. So other agents in our office can show this property, but the buyer and the agent and the buyers have to sign off on the confidentiality agreement. Whereas they need to understand this is not a property that can be publicly marketed on any level at all. And they've got to make sure their buyer, who they're going to show the property to, understands that. Because yeah. your buyer can go, boy, I saw this great house last weekend, and boy, you wouldn't be in it. Well, they start telling what it is, then we got a problem. Once we discover that, and that's going to make the property have to go in MLS. Uh, so this, this is a good thing because what it does is it gives a one of our listings exposure, uh, additional exposure to us, uh, to just our agents. And uh, you know, all of us, at some level, you've got a bunch of buyers for particular kinds of property, especially investment type properties uh, that you can reach out to and say, okay, I just had something come on. It's totally private. It's totally in-house. Um, and so if you're interested, I can provide you the information, but here's what you have to do. I've got to have you sign this confidentiality agreement uh, for me to provide information to you on the property. So you get to go through and, and deal with that. Um, it's, it's a good service. It's not something that you're going to offer up to every seller, but when a seller has a situation or they bring up a concept, they may have been talking to another agent to list their property with another company that has this. And they're going to tout it. They're going to push and say, "Yeah, you know, we've got this. We can do this. Uh, we, we've got a, we've got you know, sixteen hundred buyers out here that we work with our agents to work through the process. And so the, like your property will get exposed to all those fine folks. Uh, and so this lets you know, well, yeah, we have that too. And here's how that works. You work through the process. Uh, so it's a valuable service for certain sellers. You should work through that. Yes, sir. How do we correctly market it within? Office, our, within our uh, internal Facebook, Plano, KW Plano, Facebook. Yeah, because that's that's just that. Well, you can only do it on anything that can only be accessed by us. Uh, YouTube, for example, goes beyond us. So there's, that's why I have to be careful what I say, because when it goes on our YouTube channel, to be careful not to say anything about other brokers, you know, violation. Yeah, so it has to be in our internal. Um, the other thing is, when you get a piece of property and you have a certain situation, uh, you know, send emails out. You, you should have some kind of a uh, idea of what other agents out there who work with investors or work with different types of buyers. Um, you may have a really high dollar piece of property, two or three million dollars. Uh, it's security reasons, and so you may know those buyers, those agents within our office that works with those level of buyers. You call them maybe, you know, Nick up, call Mike up and say, hey, a $3 million listing, it's going to be totally private in-house. Uh, so who do you have on the buyer side that we got to let know about this and work through the process? 
Uh, so you, it, that's why it's really valuable for you uh, to have a sense of what all of the other agents are doing. Uh, so you can kind of work with them on particular types of properties because we want to be able to tell our sellers, you know, all these things, all these other things that all these other agents and brokers are doing, that's the same thing. We have all the same services. We have all the same abilities. You know, we've got agents who have a whole pool of buyers for different types of properties, different types of situations uh, that your property will be exposed to as we work through that. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's one, it's a good service, but also it's a good thing that is you need to um, compete with another company that's doing this and say, oh yeah, well, we've got this. And you say, well, yeah, that's a very good thing. We like it because we have it too. Here's how ours works as you work through it. How long does it stay in house? As long as you wanted to, there's no time limit. Yeah, because it doesn't really, it doesn't deal with MLS rules. Holly? Um, on the coming soon status, from the time you put a sign in the yard, how much time do you have to actually put it in MLS? Because there seems to be confusion. One day. One day. <clears throat> Technically, it's one business day. Good question. Um, and, and trust me, there are people out there who don't have a life who look for violations. And we're targets because we're so dominant in the market. People like to fuss about things. You know. So if it's there for more than one day, you're in violation? You are in violation, but for anything to happen, it's going to take someone to file a complaint. And you know, we really operate on a complaint basis. Uh, sometimes we'll we'll do something. We'll say, "Well, we understand the rule. We understand that we have some certain circumstances here that cause us to go past that one day. Um, normally, we do it one day, but somebody just died, so let's whatever." Um, so we have that ability, and we recognize that the risk is someone filing a complaint. Now, if someone files a complaint, there's a process with the uh that you know we work through, and they're big. Uh, an investigation, a hearing, and things like that. And most of the time, when we explain, here's what happened, here's what went on, uh, it gets resolved. It's unlike clear cooperation, which is automatic. So, one thousand minimum, one thousand dollar fine. Maximum, five thousand dollar fine per property. Um, it's, it's not the same with coming soon violations. Coming soon violations fall into a different set of. Uh, Rules. Got the paper? Yeah, the documents. Okay, good. Okay. Um, so we, and most of our things, like, sometimes we make, let's just make sure you're not throwing the camera. Um, so the reality is we make decisions and we look and make risk based decisions. Say, you know, we think this is a good decision. Here are the reason we're making this decision. Uh, a good example, death is on a property. Uh, we've evolved over many years on how we deal with a death on a property. Uh, we're clear what the rules are. Um, and we see what's in the text of realtor, cell disclosure. It talks, talks about the three types of deaths, you know, natural, suicide, and accidental not related condition of property. And the seller nor the agent is required to disclose any of those three. Suicide's your big challenge. Uh, because sellers have been sued, they don't disclose suicides, even though the law doesn't require it. Uh, so whenever we have something like that, we look at the risk and we make a risk-based decision. One, we look at the risk to our seller. If you don't disclose this, because it's a best practice kind of thing as opposed to a requirement kind of thing. If you don't disclose this, here's the risk. And, and primarily the risk is someone could file suit against you. And then we look at if a seller made a decision that, you know, I think that's a pretty minimal risk. I don't think it's a big deal. Uh, so I'm going to take that risk. And we decide or we will not take the risk. So what we're clear of, if our seller gets sued, so will we. We'll get sued also automatically. Uh, and what we now do, we didn't used to do this. I mean, as recently as five years ago, it's almost automatic. 
They wouldn't let us disclose and we didn't take the listing. And we've kind of changed, we've shifted. We've gotten uh, more reasonable. I've been, actually, I've got more reasonable because I'm the one that made the decision. <laughs> you got soft in your old age, Bob. I did. I, did. <laughs> I got places. Um, and so we look at it and we say, you know what? If our sellers won't take the risk and if it's a good listing otherwise, and this is not the first red flag from our seller that we think we're worried about this seller. Not so sure this is not a seller's going to create problems for us. Uh, then we probably say, okay, yeah, we're good with that and we'll go and take the listing. Um, so we find ourselves, you know, dealing with the death question much differently. Now, it was a violent death, there's no question. A violent death has to be disclosed, period, in a conversation. Uh, we do look at the timeline. Uh, if the violent death occurred, you know, 20 years ago, we're not going to deal with it. Uh, but it was something that just occurred and it was in the paper and everybody knows about it. Because uh, one of the things where we know is that when the buyers close and move in, the neighbors are right there. And they would say, oh, by the way, we got videos. Would you like to see the videos? Wait, this is Does it matter if it happened in the property or outside? Well, the see, property? The only, it, it's interesting. It's a question. So the question, so Zoomers, you can hear the question. Does it matter if it happened in the property or not? Uh, virtually 99.9% .9 of all disclosure cases deal with deaths on the property. Now, that includes, by the way, uh, in the front yard and in the driveway, in the backyard, you know, in the garage, you know, anywhere on the property. Um, now, sometimes buyers get really uh, overexcited about deaths on a property. Uh, we, we had the listing, and uh, it was an estate sale. What do we know in an estate sale? Somebody died. Somebody died. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out they didn't die on the property. They died in the hospital. Uh, but the buyer said, well, we don't want to buy that property because there's a death really, you know, involved in that property. Uh, there were probably out there at some point in time, there was probably a death. You know, somebody died sometime or whatever. So but we, we can't control all that. Uh, but if it doesn't happen on the property. Um, I had an experience a few years ago because I think about this kind of stuff all the time. So you won't have to. That I do. So I'm visiting with Max. And uh, he's telling me about a situation that we had um, in which uh, was actually one of our former agents. We had a piece of property and he committed suicide. Tragedy at every level. And so I'm sitting there and Max says, tell me about it. And what do you think my reaction was when he was explaining to me about our agent who had committed suicide? You didn't need that. Well, I said, did he do it on the property? And all of a sudden, when I realized what I just said, I had to go sit down, close the door of my office, and just sit down and think about that. Process. Our first reaction to this tragedy is what about our disclosure? Did he do it on the property? <laughs> Did he do it on the property? Sorry, guys, yeah, but I mean, that affect us. Uh, we do. We think about some of these kinds of things, and it really shifts how we think about things. Um, and he did put it on the property. He did it in the pool in the backyard. Um, and it just was a tragedy at, at every level. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, is it on the property or not? That's just... I still, every once in a while, I think about that, and I, and I feel so guilty about having thought like that as you work through it. Um, the other side of that, this particular agent who was having some challenges, family wise, had come by my office one day. You know, as you come by my office and you come inside, some of you do a great job of saying, you know what? No problems, nothing today. I just, you know, want to say bye, everything's good. Say hi. And that's great. Thank you for that. Or sometimes you have a quick question, which, by the way, rarely is, but that's okay. <laughs> um, and he came by my office, and he'd already, it had already been a number of situations. It was one of those days, and I was just buried. I was just, and he came by my first thought, oh, geez. And he said, just, just wanted to say hi. Two days later, he killed himself. 
And the last thing I remember about him was when he came by my office just to say hi. I thought, man, if I'd just taken some time and visit with him and have him sit down and let's talk about it. You know, you always, in case I catch you, always second, you know, question yourself. Yeah, okay. And that's part of this. We deal with people, we deal with people in emotional situations. At some point in time, if you've been doing this long enough, you'll have a client style. That's just, this happens when you're so close because you're dead. Um, sometimes accidents happen, sometimes, you know, so it's whatever. Uh, but that's just part of what we do and how we do it. So, but we've changed over time. So, whenever we have an important decision like disclosures of deaths and things like that, um, you need to be comfortable that we really have evolved where we are very good at making policies that are risk based. We think them through, they're based on what our experiences are, what we've gone through uh, to deal with. Yeah, here's our Here's our current policy and here's why. Uh, just like, you know, we have things that change like we now have in the Texas Realtor Listing Agreement, we have a question about whether you're a foreign person or not, foreign seller. We didn't used to have that, we have that now. Uh, and because it's there and the box is checked, you've got to address that uh, with every seller, whether you think they are or not especially that seller who you say, oh yeah, they, they've been here for 20 years. I, they can't be a foreign seller, but maybe they are. We've got one of those where our agent made the assumption that they were not a foreign seller and it turns out they were. And there were some challenges moving towards closing. So you know, you've got to really be careful what you assume about there. Is the reason for tax consequences, is that what's involved? Pardon me? The reason to find out if yeah, there, are that, that. there could be tax consequences for the seller. And one of our restrictions is we can't give them tax advice. We simply say, you know, you've got to resolve any tax issues prior to closing. Um, because foreign seller creates certain circumstances based on the price range, based on owner occupied, things like that, that could cause the title company to have to um, satisfy the seller's tax obligations, uh, take it out of the sales proceeds of the property. Uh, it's not the buyer paying it, but the IRS holds the buyer liable for those tax obligations of the seller. There's a seller is selling the house, went back to the old country, and IRS says, IRS is out of luck. So, well, we got to figure out who can we get the money from. Well, we'll get it from the buyer because they're still here. Uh, you know, it doesn't seem right. Nothing at the day or it seems right. That's okay. Uh, so, all these things, we've got, we've got good basis for them. So, when you've got something, and somebody said, well, here's our rule, here's our policy, whatever. Uh, your thought should be, okay, that makes sense, or maybe it doesn't make sense. You may say, I'm going to talk to Bob, I'm going to talk to, you know, somebody about what's behind that. Why, why is that our rule? Why is that our policy? As you work through that. Uh, for example, open houses. Uh, it used to not be true, but it's true now. If you hold an open house, you have to have an active real estate license. Was the time when you did it? If you're going to hold an open house, you have to be a real estate agent with an active license. An inactive agent or an agent without a license, admin or whoever else, uh, can be there with the active agent, the listing agent, uh, and help them and hand out flyers and things like that, but can't have any conversation with potential buyers which a license is required. One of the things that Texas requires is any prospecting conversations. You know, anything about buying, anything about selling, what do you think about selling, anything like that requires a real estate license in Texas. Not all states, but it does in Texas. So you need to be aware of some of those restrictions as you work through it. Um, but there's certain requirements. Yes, sir. We're going to open houses. Um, are we allowed to run open houses for other Keller Williams offices? Well, in our open house policies and our rules, uh, one of the things that we're saying there is that we should not hold open houses for other brokers uh, without approval of management. Uh, the reason for that, one, <clears throat> there's an agency challenge when you're sitting in the open house for Keller Williams, for, let's say DPR, Preston Road. Who do you represent? And who do you disclose when buyers walk in? Who do you disclose that you represent? Um, the bigger challenge, though, with one of our agents holding an open house for another broker, 
is that we may have sellers here who would like to have an open house, but there are no agents available. We actually had the situation, it's probably five years ago. Because it's, it's an incredibly small world. Um, one of our agents was holding an open house for another KW office. And one of our sellers who had wanted an open house happened to live next door and went in to look at the house and most of kind of thing and found out who the agent was who was holding the open house and who that agent was with, which was the company that had his listing. And he was really said, gee, I wonder why he couldn't have held my house open. He's holding another broker's house open. And because of that possibility, uh, we don't want our agents to hold open houses with other, even KW offices, certainly not other brokerages to work through that. You know, we want our sellers to come first as they work through it. Uh, we sometimes have the question on open houses, you got, you came from, you came from another office, maybe even a KW office, you got a friend there, and they don't have enough listings, and so they want to hold one of our houses open, our, do an open house for ours. Uh, we're more receptive to that because our seller client gets an open house, but we still have to deal with the agency challenge. When people walk in, who do they represent? Who do you think they represent? When, it, when an agent with another office, even a KW office, is holding one of our listings open on the weekend, who do they represent? They don't represent the seller because they're not an agent under our license. Yeah, they at that point in time, they represent their broker, whoever their broker is. And theoretically, they disclose it. The only way that you get away with it a little bit, but to KW offices, is buyers have no idea what it means on a different KW office. Oh, you're Keller Williams. Listen to Keller Williams. Okay, that's all the same thing. That's all the same company. Um, but they don't represent us. They don't represent our seller. They don't represent our us as the brokerage because they're not under our license. So you've got a little bit of an agency challenge as you work through that. Any other questions in open houses while we're dealing with that? Yes, sir. Um, I, I just I have a question. Like, when you have like, like, uh, uh, like I buyers that say they have an open house, but it's what do you mean? What do you mean they say like that? open door? Like how do they get a risk or how do they get around like having an open house with no one there? Is it okay? The reason open door can and a couple of the others do this is they're the principals. They're not the brokers. They're the principals. They okay. own. They own. So okay. Now they do some things open door particularly because they also have a brokerage. They do some things that, that we're really working through trying to get them not be able to do it. They're really in violation of the rules. Um, and they're trying to use as an excuse that they're principles, but that doesn't really work. So we're battling out on some levels. We've got several of the eye buyers and houses or open doors one up. Um, that's really created some challenges. They're working with because they're principles, they own the house. And uh, they get to do some things that they really frankly shouldn't be able to do. In spite of what the TV commercials say. Oh, yeah, I'll get married because they'll buy our house. Everything's good. Um, now, I want to go to, I've got a little quiz here, a little 23 question quiz. And uh, primarily dealing with multiple offers. Oh, I see, yeah, I'll just help you scroll up to the next one. Um, she doesn't help by two questions. She doesn't. This is necessary. She needs help in general. I need a lot of help. Lot of help. Okay. As as do I, by the way. Um, so some of these questions here apply uh, to single offers, not just multiple offers. We'll find some of the things we talk about here uh, while we're specifically addressing multiple offers, and we're back in the multiple offer stages again. We're seeing that again um, as we kind of work through it. Uh, Zoomers, have you got this? You got the multiple offer thing there? Yes, Bob, we got it. We're going to ask some questions yeah. here. And I want the Zoomers to be able to also yeah. unmute themselves and say, well, Bob, that's clearly true or false or whatever. Uh, so the first question 
says all buyers must always have the same level of information. True or false? True. Okay. true. okay, so the Zoomers say true. Most people in the class say true. Now, this is a good example of there are always several different players of this. Uh, one of the things that Trek requires is that everybody be treated honestly. Trek says, you know, you can't provide information uh, that creates, gives one buyer an advantage over another buyer. Uh, so they've got to have the same level of information. However, there are a lot of different levels of what we talk about there, uh, level of information. As long as you stay with the primary concept that you can't do anything to create a, a significant advantage for one buyer or the other. Now, every buyer's offer will be different. And just by nature of their offer, one will have a better advantage than another as you work through that. But question number one is more true than false because of the concept that we can't do anything that's going to create uh, a disadvantage for one buyer or the other. Because one of the first things that happens when you do that, you have discriminatory charges. Well, yeah, I, I see all those good white folks. They got the information, but here I am from Nigeria and I didn't get the information. Now, I know why, don't I? Okay, fine. You got problems. So, you know. Okay, number two, multiple offers includes actual received offers and offers that are on the way, including email offers. Oh, false. Yeah, so it actually has to be an offer. Now, this is going to cause, um, this is going to cause you to actually have a conversation with your seller up front about what constitutes an offer. If you've got a good piece of property and there's a lot of interest in that property, you're going to get phone calls, you're going to get emails, you're going to get texts, uh, you'll receive you know, some offers, whatever. Um, and you may get a call from an agent says, well, uh, it's a very little listing you got there. It's probably worth 400000 but uh, I'm just wondering, would your would your seller take three hundred thousand? Well, that's an inquiry. That's a question. That's not an offer. So the agent says, "I've got a buyer for that property, and they'd like to offer your seller three hundred thousand. It's an offer. That's to be communicated to your seller. Except you wisely talk to your seller and say, "Okay, here's what I'd like for you." You're going to do it in writing in the list agreement. Instruct me, the, your agent, that you will only entertain offers in writing on track promulgated forms signed by the buyer. Otherwise, you don't even want me to call you. You don't want me to send you anything. So, oh yeah, I don't want to waste time on all that other stuff. Because you have that instruction from your seller. That buyer, that agent says, hey, would your seller take 300000 Well, the problem is... A seller will only even look at offers that are in writing, signed by the buyer uh, on a track promulgated form. Yeah, because your seller is giving you those written instructions. While you're at it, could you bump the air conditioning up a little bit? I'm cold. Uh, uh, so, so you need to do that with your seller. On any piece of property, that you have any anticipation that you may have a lot of offers um, or a lot of interest in phone calls. Support. You don't want to waste your seller's time. They've worked in the back here, Miss Cynthia. Hopefully, you still there. Um, you don't want to waste your seller's time. Frankly, you don't want to waste your time uh, because you'll get lots of calls, lots of faxes, lots of whatever. Um, so, you want to make sure you pass that. So, have that conversation. So based on that conversation, uh, it's only, you're going to have that thing closed only real offers. In writing, signed by the buyer, track form, otherwise. Okay. That makes sense? You're good? Mm -hmm. By the way, uh, whether it's a multiple offer or not, you won't do that on, on every list. So your sales said, you know what? Now, you're going to make a judgment call uh, if your seller is giving you instructions, hey, I don't want to hear about it. If it's not in your way, and then things kind of go on a little bit, and maybe it's thirty, maybe it's forty-five days into the deal, and we still don't have a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, anybody calls up with anything, you let the seller know. You 
you know, work through the process. Uh, three, since the seller is clearly the decision maker, the primary duty of the agent is to accurately present the seller's choices to the other side and defend those choices. Oh. What do we mean by that? <laughs> True or false? And then what do we mean by that? True. I say I say false. I say true. So what do we mean by that? Tell me what it means that you're going to present the seller's choices to the other side uh, and then defend those choices. Choices being what? What might you be present from the seller to the other side that, that they need to know? Uh, and, and are you going to be able to defend all those choices? What do you think? I think it means not apologizing if like the seller responds in a way that you personally don't agree with, but that's their choice. You don't go to the other side and go, man, I just got this crazy seller and he says, no, I think they should do what you ask, but yeah. they're not going to do it. Yeah. yeah, you're right. You, you don't apologize. You don't make statements about your seller. You know, you say, you know, here's what my seller wants to do. I'm not sure they've taken their medication today, but we'll work through that. Um <laughs> as you go through that. So the easy way to defend their choices is don't do anything that may cause any doubt on sellers' abilities to make those decisions work through it. And the choices we're talking about that are important to the seller, not you know, the terms, not just the price, but the terms, possessions, temporary lease, title companies, all those types of things. Uh, you present those to the seller. We'll find out later in a conversation about making sure as you perhaps in a buyer, and you get all the information from the seller, but you're careful how you do that. Or the buyer, like you've switched to the other side. Um, so when we look at what we're talking about there, um, it is true. You do want to defend your seller's choices. You want to be able to effectively communicate those. Uh, you're, you're, some of your important selling that you're doing for your seller client uh, is the way you communicate just what the seller wants to do. Uh, the seller you know, wants to have a 60-day seller temporary residence lease, and here's why. Because a good buyer's agent is going to say, well, okay, why? What's, what's, what's happening here? Because the buyer needs to make a decision if they want to live it. I mean, it's in fact, well, uh, it's because the new house isn't ready yet, and it should be. It should be ready by late June, so we need some time here. Well, buyer's got to make a decision. Guess what? is notorious with builders, you know, who the builder is. It still won't be ready to June. You might be looking at September. And so you may be looking at a constant challenge in there. Well, whatever the seller's decisions are on things that they need to work through, uh, such as temporary residential lease. Uh, when, when, for example, let's say you've got a listing and the listing is $600,000. Uh, and buyer makes an offer and maybe they make an offer at 600000 and the seller communicates back says, well, the seller wants 700000 Um A good buyer's agent can say, okay, by any chance, do you have a CMA? Something that can help us? Because I need to help our buyer see why that's a good number and why that might work or whatever. Um, and you have permission in the listing agreement, paragraph 11, to provide that kind of information to the buyer side. Seller's already given you that permission to do that and you're listing it right. Um, so you need to be able to have some good rationalize. And in some cases, um, the reason the seller is counting at 700,000, maybe because, well, frankly, the sellers told me to tell you this. Uh, even by list at 600,000, he's got 27 offers. And every one of them are above list price. So I think at this point in time, the seller simply saying, you know, I'm not going to leave any money on the table. I want 700000 And why is it? Because I got a line out the door of people who want to buy my house. And buyer may say, yeah, yeah, we're not surprised by that. Yeah, kind of how that would go. Uh, so I, I think three is certainly more true than false. Everybody agree with that? You agree with that, Carol? Yeah, got it. Okay, good. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Number four. It's important to wait until a multiple offer scenario actually occurs before educating the seller on the multiple, multiple offer procedure and managing their expectations. Oh, Everybody's clear that's false. Uh, however, there's another side to this. 
Um, you want to be careful how you educate your seller on multiple offers. You want to make sure that, in fact, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all those expectations. Boy, hey, it's great. I'm going to get rich off of this house, sir. And then nobody shows up. So, why don't you must be my agent? So, you'd be a little careful. I got to buy that false. That's true. Pardon me, question. Yeah. Uh, is it okay to communicate with the buyers that there are other? Different kind of offer or better offer on the table. Is it okay to let them know? Okay, is it okay to let the buyer know what? No, no, the different buyers to know about the offers. Okay, is it okay to disclose to buyers the existence of other offers? Yes. Yeah. Um, in fact, because you actually have permission from the seller in the listing agreement to disclose the existence of other offers. Um, the key is this is the information kind of back to question number one. As you disclose to a buyer their other offers, all the buyers need to have that same level of information. So you need to disclose to all the buyers. Now you may have a first buyer who's made an offer. At that time, there were no other offers. And then a second buyer comes along and there is an offer. So the second buyer gets to know they've got a competing offer. Now, it's the seller's decision whether or not to tell buyers there are competing offers. Competing offer sometimes runs off a buyer. So I need to understand that risk. Uh, all of a sudden, the buyer says, oh, am I going to be in another one of those battles? I don't, I don't want to do that again. So I'm, I'm going to go find another house. Uh, so I need to know that. Now, but in my scenario, the second buyer is told, the seller says, yeah, he's fair. Let him know that there's a competing offer. And you got and they, and they go ahead and make an offer. Uh, and you got to go back to the first buyer and say, oh, by the way, you're now in a competing offer situation. And I have a second offer. Did you find what I've got there? Cynthia. Huh. Uh, so, yeah, the seller's permission, you're going to disclose and you have it in the listing agreement. You're going to disclose the existence of other offers. But everybody needs to know that. All the buyers need to know that. Sometimes that means you've got to back up to a buyer. Because at the time they made the offer, they were not in a multiple offer situation. Um, say you have one written offer on the check form. Everything. Um, and then you have one, somebody comes in and says, um, gives you a verbal offer. Are you allowed to go to other buyers and other agents and say you're in multiple offers at that point? No, because you're not. If you've defined offers with your seller, as I talked about earlier, that verbal offer is not legitimately an offer. Do I understand that point? Yes. If you've already agreed with your seller, the only thing that constitutes an offer in writing, signed by the buyer on track promulgated form. Anything else, we do not consider it an offer. Because uh, the reality of, of real estate, you've got an offer, and then you've got another agent who calls you up with great piece of property. I know, I know a lot of interest on this. You know, I've, I've just met with my buyer. I'm writing up the offer. I'm getting in my car. I'm headed to your office any minute now, and you never see them again. Never hear from them. That's it. Never. So you can't presume that that's going to be so until you've actually got it in hand and, and, and be honest about it, because, you know, based on your experience with agents, you've got a listing agent who's trying to create a sense of urgency and they know they've got an offer coming in and yet they may say, oh, yeah, we've got other offers. Well, all they have is other interest, other people who may be interested for the night. Thank you as well. It's a caveat to that. Same question, same kind of question. What if you have an offer from fire and then you send out say a reverse offer to somebody, and you say to them at that point to other buyers or other agents that you're- So involved. if you're sending out a reverse offer to a particular buyer, for what reason? Everybody understand the concept of the question? He's got an offer uh, that he's presented to a seller, and now maybe the seller wants to create a reverse offer, which is simply an offer that's done by the seller for their terms without the seller signing it, and what you're doing is you're sending this to a buyer saying, here's what the seller would like to do. My absolute preference is to use the Texas Realty Forum, seller's invitation to buyer to submit a new offer. Um, so why are you sending this reverse offer out to this buyer? I guess just to publicize it as a multiple offer situation. Well, it's not a multiple offer. Your seller sending a, sending a reverse offer out to the buyer does not constitute a multiple offer. It has to be from a buyer for it to be an offer. The seller sending something out to a buyer does not constitute an offer. And you have to have at least two 
Written contracts. Two written offers. Offers. Oh, offers. For you to be in a multiple offer situation. Yeah, two written offers. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, you know, I'm a fan of reverse offers. I'm a bigger fan of the form. Those invitation to yeah. I like that. Yes, sir. Is the reverse offer the same thing as the channel offer? So just say again. Is the reverse offer the same thing as the channel offer? The best offer? Oh, the the reverse offer. offer. No, reverse offer. No, and it's a good question. Uh, if your seller makes a reverse offer, one he will not sign it. No signatures, no initials, no signatures. So it's not a counter offer. One of the reasons that I like the invitation to, to submit a new offer is it actually has a language on that that says this is not a counter offer. We want to make sure it's clear. One of the risks we have each time we send something over to the seller is the buyer thinks, okay, if I do exactly that, if I sign up on that, we've got a contract. Well, you don't have, that's going to be their perception because you only have signatures for one side. Um, so that reverse offer from the seller, where I see this working most effectively is not necessarily in a multiple offer situation, but you've got a buyer who doesn't have an agent, doesn't want an agent, is going to represent themselves, uh, and, but, but it's clear they're not entirely sure how to even write an offer. So you're going to get the ball rolling by doing this from yourself in that case. And you're going to make sure you get use the representation disclosure form to take the realtor to disclose to that buyer, but you represent the seller only to work through that. Um, that's when I see that uh, most effective use of a reverse offer. Because um, the, the buyer who doesn't want an agent um, and lead you to believe they can represent themselves really can't. They just, they're doing it for money reasons. At some point in time, they're gonna ask you for some money or they're gonna try to negotiate a better price because well, you don't have to pay 3% to this side, so I don't you know, want the money or I want a better price or whatever. Work through that. And that can be a real challenge. You good on that? Yes, ma'am. Are we allowed to like, when you uh, when we do like open houses like yesterday, okay, we'll get in. House already have a offer, so he was asking how much was the offer. You said you represent a buyer or seller? No, it's just holding an open house for someone. So a buyer. Okay, so you're holding an open house. Yeah, the house already and, had. And you have offers. The listing agent already had entry bonus. Uh, okay, so a listing agent is holding an open house. Just uh, you, the open house. You're holding an open house or the listing agent. Yes. yes. You know there's an offer on the property. Yeah, the deadline is that day, 5 p.m. And a guy walked in and said, how much time <coughs> have? And okay, so, uh, so another potential buyer wants to know, one, if you've got another offer. How much? And how much it is. We, so what, do, what do we do when people ask for the terms of an offer that our seller has received? Smile. What? Me, I smile and I say, just walk around and see how much the house works to you. You really can't disclose that, right? Yeah. Okay, remember, who is the decision maker? Tell us. So we're going to make decisions based on your advice. Uh, one of the challenges, and you'll get this a lot from the other agents. I know you got other offers. Come on, Bob, help me out here. How much above list price? What have I got to do here to even be in the ballpark? What's, what's going on? You help us, you know, um, and... What you've got to do is you have to already have that conversation and sell it. Because the problem is it's a slippery slope. You start with one thing and then another because we're talking more than just the price. There's so many other criteria that are important, much more important than just the price because the price doesn't tell us the net. Price doesn't tell us the certainty of close, all those other things. Um, but we understand if sell says, yeah, you know, but I've been there. And let's encourage them. You know, let's let them know. Let's don't have them waste their time. So you know what? Yeah, we have other interest. And just to be honest with you, uh, if you're at a list price below, you're out of luck. Something that seller says, yeah, here's what we want to do. Now, what you've got to do is have a good script when an agent starts off with that. Says, okay, so um, how much is the other off? Is it a list? Is it above list? You say, well, my seller... You tell them, my seller is giving me authority to tell you uh, that it's above list. Well, how much? But no, that's it. 
Oh, yeah. And don't ask me about other things. Now, here's a little balancing act you've got. You want buyers to have enough information about what's important to the seller. Session, closing date, title companies. All those other factors are important to the seller. And, you know, the seller's net, which means in the contract, which will be paying title policy and other expenses. Um, you're going to be giving up that information because you want buyers to know, here's what's going to help you, the buyer, make the offer more attractive to my seller. Is by, you know, my seller has a, has a situation where, you know, they really need 60 days to move out. They need closing, but they need some time before they move out and work with that process. And the seller needs that. Then uh, you need to be able to communicate that to a buyer because if a buyer needs to move in in, in 30 days, not a good deal. It's not going to work out as you work through that. Uh, so you've got to give them that information without making them think, if you do these things, we got a deal. Because we don't have. We're just trying to give you certain information. But answering those questions, you would have, uh, well, how much is it for? You would have already had that conversation with the seller. And the seller saying, you know what, make a judgment call here. Is this just somebody who's throwing paper up against the wall, hope something sticks, and, you know, they're just kind of, checking things out or is this real um and you make adjustments all of the days you don't decide about where you're going to go but be prepared for the follow-up questions oh, okay okay but well, for how much and by the way but then when you get to good reasonable questions about what kind of closing <clears throat> closing time frame does the seller need what kind of possession situation do they have <laughs> you know if it's already a vacant property you know what you're doing there but if they're still living there you know where are they going from here what's their situation that's all information that you should have already had a conversation with the seller about as you work through that. Um, that puts you in control of those questions. Expect the questions. Every buyer's agent is going to ask a question because what the buyer's agent find out is most sellers tell them more than they should be. I mean, most listening agents tell them. They give up all that information. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, you should know a seller's already turned down 550 should know that. So your buyer better do better than that. You know what? That was yesterday. Maybe the seller circumstances have changed. That take five fifty in a heartbeat today. So you've got to be careful as you work through that and let them know certain things. But listing agents will just spill the beans all over the place. Um, so as a buyer's agent, go ahead and ask. Um, you know where we have the most trouble is with each other. Where are within the brokerage? Come on, Bob, Bob, it's, it's me, it's me, it's Tommy. You know, come on, come on help me out. <laughs> you know, I need this. I got a Mercedes payment coming in. I got to get this deal done. I'm going to lose this buyer. Help me out. Help me out. You know, we give each other the hardest times. It's just, you know, uh, so you got to work through it. So, um, so everybody good with uh, um, four? Is, and it's what? False. Okay. Five, having the criteria list enables the seller to have a clear objective process in selecting the best offer and eliminating the emotion factor in the decision making process. Truth. It's probably more true than false, but I intentionally put a word in here that's not the best word. Eliminate. You're not going to eliminate. You never will. Even investors have emotional factors. Uh, so you're not going to totally eliminate it. But what you want to do is minimize it. You want to manage it. You want to put it at a control, controllable level as you work through that. Um, and so, you know, as you work through the criteria. And we're going to talk in question seven a little bit more about the criteria list, which I want to talk about. Um, so number five is more true than false, but... I like to move away from the eliminating word because it's, uh, you know, you're not going to eliminate. It's not going to be. And don't expect to. In fact, don't waste time on it. You spend your time getting a sense of the emotional factors, uh, how your clients operate and where their emotions are and help them work through it, help them manage it. Uh, six, the seller will place different weight on the items in a criteria list, but the highest net will always be the most important. False. Uh, does everybody agree false? False. Why is it false? Seller depraised. Well, yeah. 
Sellers are greedy and sellers are crazy. What, what is the most important criteria for a seller? What should it be? Same. Funding. Yeah, hope to close. Certainty of close. That's the most, it doesn't matter what the price is, if it doesn't close. You know, so certainty of close, which is the most important and the hardest to determine. This is That's false. the most important. So it, it's false because that is not, anytime you have a true false question, you see always in there. So a true false question, if anything says always, it's always false. That's true. I mean, um, now we talk a little bit more in seven about criteria lists. Uh, one of the benefits of having criteria lists is the seller can give that out to buyers who question why their offer was not accepted. In fact, to avoid any conflict, the criteria list should be handed out to all interested buyers. Your boss. False. It's false. Uh, you're not going to give the criteria list out. But the reason, the two big reasons for a criteria list, we'll talk in a second about the five primary things that are on a criteria list. One is it does give the seller a track to run on. It says, yeah, here are things that I should give some thought to, I should consider as I'm trying to decide which of these offers that I want to use. Um, so that, that's an important part of it. The other is, in any kind of a complaint or lawsuit, this becomes a valuable defense mechanism. Uh, you say, okay, you know, I, here was the criteria list. Here's what I used to determine which offer I want. We need to move it up more. Okay, thank you. So we're about to go to the next page. Start with page number eight. Um, don't give out the list. Don't give out the list. Make sure you and your seller have gone over it. So your seller, when they're looking at 10 offers, they've got a track to run on. So here are the criteria. Here's what I'm going to deal with. Here's how I'm going to work through that. Um, and, and if a buyer said, well, you know what? I, I I'd kind of like to know where his criteria are. Then with seller permission, you can give it, but just not going to give it out to all the industry buyers because they can actually use it against you. Um, but what you are going to do is, is have it there so in case somebody does file a place, you know what, we, we and here, what happens is the property closes and they look in MLS, they find out in MLS that it closed for 480 and they had made an offer for 490. They said, wow, okay, yeah, uh, why did they take an offer from somebody else for less than what we offered? Did you find out we were from the old country? Is that how that happened? What's going on here? Um, are there reasons why this might close at a lower sales price than another property? Okay, well, that's the reason why a seller would take one buyer over another buyer. Oh, one, they like the buyer at, at the 480 because, you know, they're veterans. I like to support the troops. It's a good deal. Or... That 490 wouldn't work with me on, on a possession and a closing date. Uh, plus, yeah, you offer 490, but you had me pay the title policy, you had me pay for a home warranty, uh, you had expenses in there where I got 12 by 1B, you had me had me contributing $10,000. So my net was way off of what the 480 was. So there are all kinds of reasons. But a buyer will look at that and say, oh man, clear, clear discrimination when they, uh, this other lower offer over mine. Because there are other things involved. Sales price is one third of one paragraph, paragraph three C. There's so many other things involved in any offer that makes one offer more attractive than the other. Does that make sense in question seven? Question eight, if the seller is considering two offers that are very similar, except one is a contingency offer, Seller should always take the non contingency offer. False. false. Yeah, I've got some false, I've got some truths. Can a non can a contingency offer ever be better than a non contingency offer? Yeah, yes. Sure. I mean, they're very similar, but your contingency offer, uh, not only do they have it on the market, it's under contract, it's a cash deal, they're past all the contingencies. 
It's a great little piece of property. Uh, the buyer's agent did a great job providing you the CMA, a copy of the contract and everything is to the listing agent. The listing agent knows, you know, this is a slam dunk deal. And this is great. Uh, so it'd be a good reasons to take this or to take the other one. Um, so just, just the fact that it's a contingency offer, it doesn't make it a bad deal. Uh, it could be. So you need to look at both sides of this because there could be some things in the non contingency offer that frankly create some challenges that may be even worse than what's in the contingency. You see, know what the situation is. And remember, you accept that your seller still has a right to accept another offer on a backup basis and kick out that one with the contingency offer. So uh, it wouldn't always be. Wait, will you say that again? Tell me what you just said about kicking out. Yeah, the seller has a right to consider other offers on a backup basis and send a notice to the first buyer saying well, to the buyer who's in the non in the contingency offer. If you don't waive that contingency, we're going to kick you out. Okay. Grab B of the addendum. Um, so the, the flip side of this, if you've got the buyer and it's a contingency situation, get your ammunition, get your stuff done. You know, be able to convince the seller why this is really still a good offer. You know, it's under contract, it's going through the process, here's all the information on the property. I mean, you know, we're sitting here in a really nice little $350,000 house up in Frisco, one story under contract, cash deal. Here's why this is a good deal. I mean, this is why, in fact, it's such a good deal that a good buyer's agent says, you know what, even though you really do have to sell this house to buy this house, we have enough contingencies in the contract that we may not want to use this addendum because you can be protected with some of your other like HOA, self-disclosure, other kinds of uh, ways to get out to pay attention to the timelines. Uh, you don't automatically have to have a contingency offer or a contingency addendum just because the buyer has a house sale. And remember, the other thing is, and I, I have no explanation for this, easily half the listing agents aren't even going to ask you. Well, will your buyer have a house to sell? I'm really just to be okay if you could tell me. I'm sorry, I haven't asked. It drives me nuts. Why would you not always ask that question? Jesus. So, one of the things you always ask, period. Single offer, mobile offer, you always, always, always. Does your buyer have a house they need to sell in order to buy a buy list? Well, like, no, no, no. Yes or no. This is an easy question. <laughs> yes or no? Well, they got, well, that was just a no. That was just a yes. That was just a no. You got to push them on. In fact, theoretically, people can't lie to you about it. But when they kind of fudge on the answer, you really know what the answer is. Well, you know, uh, technically, um, you just told me they do. Got a house, they got to sell. The other side of it is if they've got a house they need to sell to qualify to buy yours, it may be on the edge. They may say, you know what? Talk to the lender, and technically they qualify to own both houses. Technically, they qualify. Doesn't mean they want to. Yeah. Buyer may say, eh, I really had to. You may have a buyer who's going to use one of the contingencies to get out of the deal because they really don't want to own both houses and have two sets of mortgages. So you really do need to know, even if they can technically qualify for both, they have a house that they're really going to sell before they move into your listing. Really need to ask them that. Uh, nine, which of the following questions about a listing agent? Um, should a listing agent ask a buyer's agent regarding the buyer and their offer? First one, A, of course, is clear. We just talked about that. And I've asked them. I said, which of these do you think is correct? E. Pardon me? E. E. They're all good. They're all questions. Now, um, we always know we're going to ask, you know, for proof of funds, we're going to actually have a house to sell. But look at some of these others. Is your buyer actively working offers on the first many other houses? You want to know what they're doing out there. Are they in contract on other houses? This, last, this next last one. Have they terminated previous contracts? 
to one of our agents, had the buyer. And after we had our little conversation, I said, so tell me again why you're working with this buyer. The buyer had just terminated their third These people aren't going to close on a deal for a lot of different reasons. They can't ever make a commitment. Now, from a buyer team standpoint, you really do need to decide am I really going to still work with this buyer? But from a listing agent standpoint, from a seller standpoint, do I want to enter a contract with a buyer who just went away on the last three? No. Oh, remember, certainty of close. What's the certainty of close there? Not very good. We need to know it. You terminate your other contract. Um, yes, sir. Is there a way of finding out that? I mean, other than just asking the point blank question, can you find out? Or is there a way to look at anything in MLS where you can look up buyers who have terminated other contracts? You obviously have information about sellers, listings, but I don't know anything on the buyer side. But they don't put that information in until it closes. Yeah. Yeah. Or, done. yeah. So you just gotta ask. I think you gotta ask. Yeah, if they close. say no, I've never put an offer in. If they just, you just. Now, this is where problem. your judgment call, and this is where your judgment call comes into, um, especially pathological liars. Yeah. The, the hardest thing to deal with them is they believe what they just told you is true. Pathological liars don't recognize they just lied to you. I'm mean, serious. What they just said, as far as their concern, is true. And, and sometimes, you know, the, the belief systems you go through. Uh, my, my late grandmother on my dad's side, it just sweet, sweet lady. But she had some beliefs about things that just... Questionable. For, for example, she was absolutely clear we've never been to the moon. No question. That's showbiz. That's, that's, we've never been to the moon. And I tried to, because I was in college, I tried to explain to anyone. You know, and, and that's right. One of my logic, I said, okay, um, have you ever been to China? No. Well, how do you know China exists? She said, well, I'm not so sure about that. I didn't know where to go from there. That's a thing that just doesn't happen. And it's pathological liars. They just believe certain things, and it's hard to, to get past that. <laughs> Uh, uh, 10, the above questions should only be asked of buyers of whom you are suspicious. All of them. Everybody, all buyers, all buyers, all, all buyers. Now, some of us, not me, but some of us are suspicious by nature. And it's not because you're a bad person, it's because of your sets of experiences. Every time you turn around, somebody's lying to you about one more thing. And at some point in time, you've got to guard against those judgment calls because it gets in the way of you or your client getting into a good deal. You say, oh, I know what they're doing here. I just, I know, boy, you can't trust these people. I just, you know. Um, so everybody, all of ours. They're trying not to be suspicious of everyone. So 11, which of the following are factors the seller should understand and use in making decisions regarding the multiple offer process? What do you think? Well, all of them are important. Yeah, no question about it. The seller should understand all of these. Uh, so you need the seller needs to understand what are they gonna to disclose to the buyers uh, about offering, offering price, what, what is an offer, what's not an offer. Uh, the seller needs to make sure buyers understand a multiple offer. What's their time? How long are they going to entertain multiple offers? When are they going to sit down with their agent and make a decision and accept or counter or whatever? They need to know that. Um, they should work through it. What's going to be the timing of presentation, timing of the decision? Now, because uh, often you'll see, for example, a multiple offer where the listing agent will provide the information, multiple offer. Uh, seller, you know, will view all the offers, you know, by, we're going to sit down with them at eight o'clock on, you know, Wednesday the, the 19th or whatever. Um, and so, by the way, if you like, I've got that much time to make sure they get that final one in. But the seller can change their mind. You know, even when a seller gives you a timeline and says, I'll continue to, you know, look at offers all the way to Wednesday at 5 p.m., we get together that night. 
then all of a sudden something comes in and sells it. Whoa, no way I'm going to lose this. I want this the future. Seller can do that. Or so doesn't have to give buyers that amount of time that they originally agreed to. They can accept an offer into a contract at any time. They have the right to do that. Your job is then going to be communicate to all these people and says, yeah, here's the So if you've got a buyer and you see that time frame, make sure your buyer understands right now, here's what we've been told, but it may or may not. They may do something in round. Um, so yeah, they're all important things. Number uh, number 12, best strategy for a buyer is to make an offer on terms and price that work for the buyer and then be prepared to negotiate a counter offer from the seller. True or false? True. You think you're going to get a counter offer from the seller? The seller won't look at it. Okay, you make an offer uh, and you made a, an offer. Now, hopefully, you're making an offer. It works for you, the buyer, but you have good information about what are the important key points for the seller. So you made an offer to create the best net and to deal with their situation for possession, closing, and things like that, temporary lease, not so. Um, so you made a good offer. You cannot be assured on any level that the seller will do anything with your offer. You, you, you really got to take the position that this may be it, totally. They're going to accept this offer or not accept this offer. Maybe they'll counter it if, that's, if it's close enough uh, or they'll use that great little form that Bob likes a lot, invitation to make the offer. Uh, but you can't make an offer and, and count on just them coming back with, with whatever. Um, so you, I think that on any piece of property that you made the judgment call that this is a good piece of property, even though there may or may not be multiple offers at this point in time, it's a good enough piece of property that you expect that there will be. Your buyer needs to, move, needs to move quickly and make your highest and best right then uh, without any anticipation of something happening from the other side. You've got to help them do that. And that's hard. Sometimes a buyer has to lose a deal or two so they realize how important it is to do that. Uh, you've got to kind of work through that. Pardon me? What do you think? False. I think it's false because you cannot expect, you cannot say to the buyer, don't worry, make our best, highest, and best right now, and we'll get a counter. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Can't expect that. Uh, 13, one of our greatest challenges is advising the seller on evaluating and choosing an offer without making decisions for the seller. It is a challenge. It depends a lot on your client. Um, one, of the, one, of the, one of the hardest things for me is when one of you calls. Yeah. Say, well, what do you think the client wants to do? And he says, oh, they'll do whatever I tell them. I don't ever want to hear that. Please don't do that. Because yeah, that's a lawsuit or a track of plane looking for a place to have. But I also understand the other side of that. You've got clients who so rely on you. They're looking for you to help them to make a decision to the point where you're making the decision. And by the way, you do make decisions. You make decisions with every, with every client. You make decisions on how much you tell them, which property you show them, because you know that they're only going to pay attention to relevant information, which means you better really understand what's important to them. As you work through it and try to deal with it. Um, but you have to be careful. Uh, they're going to trust you. And one of the things that hurts us in court or with the investigator from track is when the client says, Well, I, I didn't know. I just trusted my agent. I just trusted my agent to tell me what to do. I didn't know. And by the way, they do. And you know this with some clients. On the, now, some clients, it's the exact reverse drives you nuts because they won't listen to you. They're going to do whatever they're going to do. Mm -hmm. And you just deal with that. Uh, but you do have to be careful as you're going through the process and you're advising them uh, because when you're sitting there looking, even if like it's just four or five offers uh, and you've done your spreadsheet, you've got everything set up and you pointed out, here's the pluses, the minuses, here's the criteria, here, here, here's why this is important on this one and this is important on this one. Here's what we've got here. Um, 
you're making decisions on what you're going to emphasize, what you're going to talk about. And, and almost always, you can at least say, well, I don't know about it. What do you think? Which one do you really like? What, what are you going to tell them? And they say, what do you think? Which one do you really like? What are you going to tell them? But by the way, you may like one more than any of the others. What are you going to tell them? The decision's up to you. The decision. I can present you with the facts, but the decision's yours. Yeah, and you have to do it. You have to have a good script. You have to do it in such a way as you work through the process to help them understand your role. And it's an incredibly important role for you to provide information to them in a manner in which they can make decisions. This means you've made a judgment call on the kind of person they are. Some people are just, it's hard for them to make decisions and you really have to go over the edge to help them be in an environment to make decisions. But it's hard. Some people it's harder than others. Some people, it, it, you know, someone who's incredibly analytic and goes through the process won't trust somebody who's making a quick decision. There's just no way that you had enough information to be able to make that decision. So it depends on how they do that. You need to move. Oh, yeah, we need to move up to the next page. Thank you. Um, so basically, if you start page 14 or question 14. So as you go through that process, you've got to make that check call, but you've got to find ways to help them feel comfortable with the decision that you think they're about to make without making a decision for them. Uh, back when I was doing production back in the old days, <laughs> I had this, this nice couple, um, and there were two houses one block apart. And uh, both of them were really nice houses. Both of them hit their profile, worked well, whatever. Um, one, one of them we saw on a day it was, was nice and bright and sunshiny, and, the other one we saw on the day was kind of cloudy a few different times. Uh, and one of the houses, um, when you're inside, it, it, it kind of felt dark. It was a little bit of, but it still had all the same features, things like that. And the other one was really light and bright and, and much nicer. So we got to the one that they did end up buying. So, you know, I don't know about it. It's really close. I mean, you got all the same features and all that kind of stuff. No. Same script with all that kind of stuff. I said, what do you think? Which one do we think? What do you think? Which one should know the market and resale and all that kind of stuff? Which one should we buy? And I did have a preference in one or the other, but it's, you know, I just smiled said, I think you see yourself in this house, don't you? I supported the decision. I think they did pretty big. I see, I think, I, I think you see yourself in this house, don't you? Look at each other. Yeah. Yeah, we do. And they bought that one. I didn't tell them they should have bought that one. I just helped try to help them confirm a decision I felt like that they had already really kind of come. And you've got to do that. You've got to see what their, their sense is, judgment call, all those kind of things, and help them make that final decision if they work through it. Questions on that? That makes good sense. The things they rely on us for, the astronomical. Um, you know, we're, we're dealing with people, we're dealing with people in challenging situations. Um, and it may be somebody that, frankly, you don't know at all until this particular relationship and building that level of trust where they're going to really, you know, respect your credibility and support. It's hard. It's incredibly hard. And it's what makes a good real estate agent more valuable. It makes it all the difference. Well. Okay, so 14. Uh, we advise our buyer on important issues for the seller, as this will improve the buyer's likelihood of success. But if we're not careful, the buyer may think we are becoming an advocate for the seller since we appear to be slanting the offer in favor of the seller. What do you think? So, so it's asking: Is the buyer does the buyer think you're trying to be more for the seller? Or do we have to be careful because the buyer may think that we're providing him all the information? Here's what the seller wants. Here's what the seller wants. Here's what the seller. I said, you kind of flipped over to the seller side here. Yeah. Are you kind of representing the seller now? I thought you were our agent. Is it possible the buyer begins to think that way? It is possible. Not only possible, it is. It happens. 
uh, and we, we've had that situation to the point that you have to actually say something to them. I'm going to provide you a lot of information uh, that we think would make your offer more attractive to a seller, but you've got to decide what's important to you. We are your advocate. I mean, you've got to tell them that, or they're going to say all this stuff you're doing is really more to the benefit of the seller. And by the way, uh, it is, but it's a benefit to the buyer and the buyer's offer is going to get accepted. But you, you really have to address it because they begin to think that way. And when things start to go south, they begin to blame you. Say, you know what? We could tell you didn't have buyer in your heart. You really, like now we've discovered that you knew the seller and you and the seller used to date. And so you guys are good buds and all kinds of things. None of it may be true. <laughs> so, so you really do have to say it. You have to work it out. Um, so 14 is true. You really got to be careful of that. Uh, 15, the buyer's agent will only advise your buyer to make your highest and best offer at the beginning if the agent knows there are other offers. Yeah, you can be assured that if it's a multiple offer situation does develop, the listing agent will notify their buyer and ask for a highest and best offer. That is totally false. false. You know, you even though a good listing agent is going to let you know, they should let you know, a lot of them won't. I'll never hear from them again. In fact, good listen, he says, you know what? You're a good experience agent. You knew this is a hot piece of property. I can't believe you expected anything more than yeah, your name. You should have had your buyer make their highest and best at the very beginning. What are you, you know, playing games here? I've heard about you people. Whoever you people are. You're from Oklahoma. Yeah, probably are from Oklahoma because you know that's what the that's how they do things in Oklahoma. You can't trust those people. Right, Cynthia? It is so false. <laughs> 16, which of the following is the most effective strategy for a buyer in a multiple long situation? What do you think? You think D? D is in Donald? That's in Donald Robert Baker. So what you're saying is she's saying is that if you have been able to determine what's important to the seller, maybe it is terms. Uh, so whatever your buyer can do to make it most attractive to the seller, attractive, attractive to the seller, still something it's buyer can live with, do that. So let's look at the others, how they may or may not. Uh, what? A. A. So look at A, make a high offer to get into a contract and worry about the details later. <laughs> when we had the really aggressive multiple offers about a year and a half ago, a lot of buyers did that. Says our total objective here is to get into a contract. Yep. This may or may not be the best house. We just want to get into a contract. And as listing agents, we knew that. We said, okay, we got to be really careful. We want to make sure we don't have our seller into a contract with a buyer who just wants to get into a contract. And then they're going to do things otherwise. We still see this a lot with investors. To get into a contract and then then they start analyzing the property to determine if it really works for them or not. Um, so uh, so in B, make offers on as many properties you can all the same time and hope one of them meets exception. Same thing, we had that. We had buyers who were making multiple offers, lots of different properties, and, and nobody was asking them. You know other offers? I don't think that's any of your business. You ask me stuff like that. C so make an offer with a large down payment to impress the seller, even if that is not uh is not your intention. We were having this is one of those dirty tricks things. Talk about that in another question. Uh buyers are making an offer, a uh, nice little four thousand dollar house, and they're gonna put two hundred thousand down and borrow two hundred thousand. Well, that sounds good. Well, that's almost a cash deal. You know, the only you got a house that's worth four hundred thousand. It's going to borrow two hundred thousand. That's great. Does that mean that they're going to close putting two hundred thousand down? And they're not required to. It's all cash to the seller anyway. What you've got in paragraph three with down payment and loan amount, sales price. The only thing that counts is sales price. So the reality is, you know, a buyer can be using that uh, to make their offer look more attractive when they have no intention of putting that amount down. They've been qualified by a nice big bank loan for 5% down, and that may be what they end up doing. 
and, there, and there's, there's not anything that makes them have to do this uh, at closing. Does everybody understand that? Zoomers, are you good with that? So you, they can. You can make an offer with a large down payment and that's not how you close. And you don't have to change or do anything in the contract to change that. The only reason the buyer did it up front was to make your offer look more attractive. Still A plus B still C. C's, C's what's going to... C's problem. all that count. Paragraph 3C, sales price, that's all that counts. Now we have new language in the new contracts in paragraph 3B, 3A and 3B, where we talk about barred fund. Do that paragraph 3B. Uh, and that just deals with cash versus barred funds and those types of things. But the uh, reality is we've got to look at things that a buyer offers that might make this more attractive than another offer. And many sellers will often look at uh, down payment as a big factor when, in fact, uh, a buyer who's putting 5% down may be incredibly well qualified, better than like, someone else put 20% down, 30% down. They have, may have to do that to have any hope of buying the deal, getting a good loan. Uh, they're not as good a buyer as the one who's all has to do is put 5% down. Guy uh, may be putting 5% down because he's a neurosurgeon and he's got all kinds of qualifications. Just lying out the door of lender said, hey, let us loan you money. Let you money. So you need to be very careful what a seller puts emphasis on in the way of down payments and option fees and things of that nature. From a buyer standpoint, uh, I, I lean more in this market to the D. I think that's a better one. The buyer needs to determine what can they live with, and let's, and they're telling their agent, their buyer's agent, get as much good information from the seller as you can to know what's really attractive to the seller will make our offer better than another offer, and we'll make an offer with as much of that as we can live with. So, I, I mean, you, you, there's, you know, uh, there's several of these that are good strategies. Uh, I think in today's market, A is not as needed as it was a year and a half ago. We saw that a lot then as you go through the process. Um, I don't like B. The reason I don't like B is a buyer's agent. It's wasting a lot of time, making a lot of offers. This is too small a world where it gets around about you and your buyers. Well, that kind of thing. Bob comes with that buyer who made 27 offers. 27 properties. Didn't hear the contract on any of them. So, and see, of course, you know, it's one of those dirty tricks in there. So, 16, you can choose on these, but I like D the best. It's with good information and sell shot. That makes sense. We good? Uh, 17, a larger and normal earnest money will impress the seller more than a larger than normal. Option fee. What do you think? True. False. I think the correct answer is it depends. Some sellers look at the amount of the earnest money is really important. And some sellers look at the amount of the option fee is really important. Remember the challenge with the earnest money. For the seller to actually get that earnest money, you know, we've got to have something happen that lets them get it. Because remember, if you close, Seller didn't get any of the earnest money. It's all goes to the sales price. If it doesn't close, the seller have a battle with the buyer about getting the earnest money. The option fee, the seller gets it. Close, doesn't close. You know, now, now this option fee is going to be created the sales price in new language, new contracts. Uh, so it depends. Now, uh, kind of depends on one of the things that earnest money does is create some credibility for the buyer. So if you have a situation where uh, you know, $1.2 million piece of property and the buyer puts up $5,000 in earnest money. Let's make it even better. $1.2 million cash transaction and the buyer puts up $5,000 in earnest money. What's the seller's question on this? We're going to close in a couple of weeks and you're going to pay me that $1.5 million she only put up 5,000 now, where's your money? Yeah. Where's your money today? You're gonna to expect a certain reasonable amount, you know, at least 1% of the sales price. Uh, 
uh, as you're going to go through that. If I'm going to buy a house at 1.5 million, very reasonable for me to expect 150,000 earnest money. You work through that. Um, so it establishes a certain level of credibility, even though the seller says, you know, I'm not going to get that. We had a, uh, one of our agents had a doctor buying a house. It was a cash transaction, $350,000 cash. Um, and his earnest money was $350,000. What do you think seller's reaction was? $350,000 cash price. Yes. Yes. He said, I love that. He said, that guy is putting up sales price right now, today. And the, and he took that offer over a higher offer because of certainty of close. This is a serious buyer. Like, this is a buyer who's putting his money up right now. Somebody said, wow, man, you put a lot of money at risk. I said, no, if I put up 10000 we might be about but three hundred fifty thousand. We're going to go to court for you that money. So, in certain situations, earnest money can be used as a negotiating tool to get your offer accepted over others. So, it kind of depends a little bit on what might be happening, what might be going. So, do you see why seventeen? It depends on what's important to the seller. It might be the option, it might be the earnest money. It depends which one would be better. Okay. Uh, Eighteen. In today's hectic, fast-moving, multiple offer environment, there may be a tendency for buyers to employ dirty tricks, negotiation tactics. Which paragraphs are these tactics likely to involve? Now we need to go to the next page. Hannah is going to come up here and work our thing. This is going to now require you to be pretty familiar with the, term, with the paragraphs of the contract. So first, the, the, we're looking for which which paragraphs, if somebody's going to employ dirty tricks, might be more used than others. Uh, look at paragraph A, 3A and 3B. We've kind of already talked about that. 3A and 3B deals with down payment financing. People will make use of those, could make use of those as a dirty trick to lead the seller to believe that you're going to borrow a certain amount of money for a certain amount down that you're not, have no intention of doing. You're just doing it to make it look more attractive. Paragraph 2A of third-party financing data. That's the buyer approval paragraph of third-party financing data. And make use of that uh, with their time frame. Uh, they may put, for example, either extreme. They may put a very short time frame. You've got a buyer who's doing, you know, not 20% down, 80% financing, and he puts five days in there. That's going to be really hard. I mean, it can't be done, but there needs to be a lot of stuff because remember, one of the challenges for a lender, they may totally have approved this buyer. Everything is great. What they haven't done is identify the property. You better have that contract moving forward on the deal so people can make use of that. The other extreme is if you're not careful, the number of days they have in 2A for buyer approval may be all the way closing. Be the direction, be careful. A paragraph five in the contract, which is where you our earnest money and our option fee. Make use of those ways we just talked about. In paragraph 11 in the contract, special provisions. They may put language in there that creates some real challenges, and the transaction makes it appear like something other than what it should be uh, as you work through it. So you want to be a little bit careful working through that. Um, these are all, so I, I think. E is correct. All of the above paragraphs can be used in very tricks. I guess we're going to need to do it again. I had a class in several years and I've done it. It talks about how dirty tricks in negotiation. So we may need to do it because you need to learn that. So when they're used against you, you know how to do it. But we may have to work through that again. Uh, 19, the virus should not include emails, pictures, or personal notes. As a seller is simply going to make an objective bottom line decision on which offer to accept. What do you think, Zoom? Any Zoomers left? 19? What do you think? I'm still here. What do you think? Should a buyer do that? Or is a seller just going to make an objective decision anyway, so it doesn't matter? Mm. 
There's always a could there could there be a situation in which a seller does respond? This is the yes. category of love letters. Yes. Yes. Yeah, certainly. Uh, what is our policy on love letters? Anybody know? Official policy is not a good idea. Okay, so Holly says our official policy is not a good idea. Uh, so let's expand on our official policy. She's partially right. <laughs> One, the buyer has a right to do that. Or has a right. Could it make a difference? Yes. What we want to do is help our buyer understand um, they need to be very careful in their love letter to not address any protected classes. Uh, they need to understand, and we need to, as much as we can, find out what the seller feels about this. Uh, because the reality is, some sellers and listing agents say, you know what? Uh, we don't want any offers with love letters. In fact, if you send an offer with a love letter, it's going to work against you. It's not going to help you. Uh, because who's at risk in a love letter is the seller. He could be accused of discrimination. Um, so our conversation is to let our buyer know, says, you know, you have a right to do it. It might make a difference. It also might put you at a disadvantage. And you just need to have a good, clean uh, letter that doesn't protect, doesn't set on, touch on any protected classes. Uh, you know, to me, the ones that are the best, uh, you know, you're a veteran. And many people will accept an offer of a veteran because they want to support the troops. And that can sometimes work out. Uh, so I, I think that the reality is, uh, it, one, it's, it's false to think the seller is going to make an objective decision. The seller got all kinds of emotion in their decisions. It's just not an objective decision. So I think anything the buyer can do, uh, we see time after time in which uh, a buyer ends up for a number of different reasons meeting the seller, maybe in a, at the open house or maybe in certain showings of the property or whatever, and the buyer and seller get along and they meet and stuff like that. And that's what makes the seller take this buyer's offer over another buyer's offer. So they're, they're not making an objective decision. They're just saying, no, we, like, we like these people owning a house. We think it's be good for the neighborhood. And all that kind of stuff. So it's not a nice, simple, objective decision. So I think it's, I think 19 is false. Yeah. Um, and I think they can include, they certainly can include, you just need to guide them in that. Uh, don't automatically say, well, no, sorry, you're not allowed to do that. Because you are allowed to do it, just certain cautions. Yeah. Uh, 20, when responding to multiple offers, the seller must use the direct form, seller's invitation to buyer to submit new offer. So the seller's response will not be considered a counter offer, true or false. Why is it false? They don't have to use it. Why else is it false? You can just reply to the one you want or the one that the seller wants. <laughs> yeah. Another reason it's false is not a track form. Ah. It's a text broker form. DXR form. But, and, and he's right, must is too strong. However, as you already know, I'm a fan of that form. Right. And it does have good language that's, that does say that it's not a count, that it's not a counter offer. That's really more language. Uh, you still have to be careful to make sure that your buyer's agent is not an idiot and say, oh boy, if you'll just do these things, you've got a deal. Unnecessarily the case. So when you look at 20, it's false. You said it's a what one? Texas Rural Report. Texas. Texas Texas. Texas. 21, the listing agent is meeting with the seller and presenting five offers. The seller must review and consider all five offers and make a decision on which offer to respond to, if any. False. 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 They don't have to look at them all. No, that's false. false. They don't have to look at anything. They say, you know what? Thanks for the offers. I got to get work my nap in. I get through with all that. Watch all the reruns of emergency. And they might be out there. I don't know. Um, now, you, you hopefully you've educated your seller about the process and what they really need to do. Uh, one of the challenges we have is you've got five offers and you're going through the process. You've got them all lined out, nets and all those kinds of things. And seller gets to the second offer says, why are we even looking at anything else? I'm going to take this. I like this one. And I don't waste my time on anything else. Seller didn't have to look at all of them. 
doesn't have to respond. No. In Texas, the seller does not have to even acknowledge the existence of an offer. Not required to do anything. Other states actually have counteroffer forms. Texas does not. Do I hear something on the Zoomers? You give me that? Okay. So 21 is false. 21 is false. Yes. 22, to, to prevent the seller from being overwhelmed, Lucian should place a limit, for example, 10, on how many offers will be received and considered by the seller. False. False. Now, could the seller do that? Yes. Yeah, sure. Here's your challenge. How do you determine which 10? I've well, got 25 offers. You're going to have to look at all 25 offers to decide on which 10 you're going to present to the seller. If the seller says, yeah, just give me the 10 best. Really? How do you do that? How do you, how do you choose the 10 best? You've just made decisions for your seller. They have to determine it. Yeah. But, but you say, you know what? We got 47 offers. I'm not going to look at 47 offers. <laughs> Pull together the 10 best. So you're going to say to yourself, okay, based on your criteria, let's establish what you think makes these the 10 best. Is it net? Is it, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Because you've got to have something from your seller to determine the 10 you're going to present to them. And then you'll want your seller to acknowledge an email. You said, if you remember, there are 37 more offers that you instructed me not to present to you. And here are the 10 based on your criteria, your chosen criteria that I presented to you. It may be that one of those other 37 is better than these 10, but you've acknowledged that that's what you chose to do. Yes, ma'am. So what's the etiquette when, between agents, we have to acknowledge that we've received it and that's it stopped there, right? Well, that you received it and any other information you have in the seller, like when are they gonna, how long are they gonna look at offers? When are they gonna make a decision? Gonna present all that information that you may have from the seller to the buyer's agent. Okay, then what do you owe them when they've made it, the seller has made a decision and you need to communicate that? What, what you owe them is to let them know. Hello, speaking of Tommy, which we just were. Yeah, we just used the word professional. Yeah, so. so uh, so you, well, if they have, if they made a counter or they're working another offer, you need to let all the agents know, here's what my seller's done. They need to know that. So they can advise their buyer to move on. Isn't that right, Tommy? You agree with that? Yes. They need to know that by email. So finding it out. Email's email fine. It's not cool. Finding out what? Finding it out and listing that the buyer's made a decision. And we've but there's no offers. rule that you have to do that. It's a professional courtesy. I think you should tell everybody you've accepted an offer. But there's no trek rule. There's no NAR rule. There's no rule anywhere that says you must reach out to every offer you got and said you didn't get it. Article that, Article One, Article Sixteen of the NAR Code of Ethics addresses both of those. Yes. How we deal with other agents, how we work for the process. Trek says you've got to treat everybody honestly and fairly, and not letting them know that their buyer needs to move on because here's what the seller has done. Especially if the seller has actually accepted another offer in their contract, and what you're going to do is say, you know, and my seller would like to entertain backups. Uh, it's your responsibility to make sure you've communicated that. Are you in violation of the NAR Code of Ethics if you don't? Uh, and Trek says, we don't like you treated it. these people fairly and honestly. So you want to really go overboard in your professionalism. Right, Trek? So when you had a multiple offer and your seller is finally accepting one, do you reach out to the other buyer's agent and say, here's what my seller's done? I'll every one of them. Okay. And, and, and four times a night, they'll say, I can't believe you called me up because I haven't heard from anybody else. <laughs> that, that yeah. is, I mean, I know the market that we were in, people were killing themselves to get these yep. It's just a professional courtesy to call them up and let them know that I love it. And they will remember him on the next deal when he's on the other side, and that'll make a difference on them working with her. I just, I, I call them, if they don't answer, I'll leave voicemail, and I'll text them. It sucks to be you. Yeah. <laughs> he, that, is, that is so valuable. <laughs> it's such a small world. Well, if I just had some problems. <laughs> it's better hurry. Speaking of which.
That makes sense, though. Holly, you understand? Is that be good? No, I know you? that's what I did, but yeah. I was saying, like, during the, the Hunger Games of real estate a couple of years ago, yeah. and I had plus offers, yep. a lot of times people were not responding. Oh, it's exactly what he was talking about. People were not responding. Uh, yeah. And you know what? You remember that on the next deal. It absolutely works against you and works against your client. Uh, you work through um, and so 2023, 20, most important strategy for the agents is to be professional, patient, and just be nice, even when it appears that it's not being appreciated by the other side. And that's absolutely true. Got to be nice, even when they're not being nice. Yes. Because it's too small a world. Yes. Yeah. And people will remember. Yes. Uh, now, I do want to touch very quickly. Anybody ever heard the phrase sub-agency? In MLS, you have the ability to put input on that line SAC, BAC, BAR. SAC, sub agent commission, BAC, buyer agent commission. Our policy is SAC will always be zero because there's a perception, even though it's not truly in the rules of Netris, there's a perception. But if you have a number in SAC, they think you're offering sub-agency. We do not offer nor accept. We do not do sub-agency on any level at all, ever. Can you define it again? Can I do what? Can you define sub-agency? Now, let me define sub-agency. You're working with a buyer customer. And because you have to represent someone, you're the buyer customer is interested in a particular property. So you call the listing agent and say, I've got a buyer interested in your property, but I don't represent them. And since, as you know, I need to represent someone, I'd like to represent you and your seller on this property as a sub agent. They say, okay, fine, because if you want a good offer on this property, I'd be, mean, yeah, we'd be happy to work with you. That means that you are a sub agent of the listing broker and you owe your fiduciary duties to the seller. Yeah. Oh. Yet you're with another brokerage. What box? Just yeah. like, I'm sorry, I'm hit Everybody hear that okay? Summers, I hear you saying something. Question? So we've got more to this. Here's the other side. Here's the other part of this. It's not just you. Remember, all agencies at the broker level. So the broker, our broker, is a sub-agent of the listing broker and represents the seller. And every agent of our broker represents that seller is a sub-agent of that listing broker. So the, our broker now represents the seller who's with the REMAX listing. And one of our other agents has a buyer client who wants to make an offer on that same REMAX listing. The broker, our broker now represents a buyer client, our agent, and also represents the seller with another brokerage. That agent relationship doesn't exist in Texas. You've got a huge conflict because it's all at the broker level and every agent of the broker is an agent of every client of the broker. All clients are clients first of the broker. You may have a listing, and that and that seller will never know or meet the listing agent. It's coming with the broker. Never know who the broker is. But that listing agreement and that agent relationship is between the seller and our broker. Yes, ma'am. What situation has to occur that a buyer's rep could waste time with a buyer customer? You say that again? It's the difference between a customer and a client. Why is the buyer's rep putting themselves in that position? It wouldn't be a buyer. You wouldn't have a buyer rep. You'd have a buyer customer. Right. That's right. what I'm saying. It's the difference between a client and a customer, right? Well, you don't have to have a buyer rep agreement for them to be for them to be a client. Should. Somewhat you can be in a full-blown agent relationship with a buyer without anything in writing. You can have a total, uh, you know, agency relationship, complete agency relationship with the buyer uh, because you're providing fiduciary duties 
to that buyer, they're your, they're your client, you're their agent, yet you have nothing in writing. If you've got truly a customer, because in Texas, you have to represent someone if you're performing real estate activities. If you've got a customer, you have got to find somebody to represent. And you've got a challenge. So our agent had to buy a customer. And uh, our agent made the mistake of saying to the buyer, who happened to also be an attorney, uh, we're going to represent you in a transaction. And state law requires you sign a buyer representation agreement. The attorney said, no, that's not what state law requires. I'm not required to sign a buyer representation agreement. And the agent said, well, well yeah, because you're my client, you have sent. And the attorney said, no. My broker requires. No, no. Yeah, state law does not require it. But so the attorney was digging her heels in. And uh, Attorney was wanting to make an offer on, on a property that actually happened to be one of our listings. So we needed to have an enemy relationship and we get sent for immediately in our representation agreement. So I had to visit with, I finally visited with the attorneys, nice lady, once we got past the initial challenges. And I said, okay, first of all, let's make sure we agree that you're a client. Yeah, you're representing me, you owe me all your fiduciary duties, I'm a client. Even though we don't have anything in writing, I'm a client. Now we're looking at an offer, one of our listings, which would create an enemy relationship. And we have to have written consent from you for that enemy relationship. And we tend to get that in a buyer rep agreement. She said, I understand that. And I have no problem with giving you written consent for an enemy relationship, but I'm not signing a buyer rep agreement. Now, fortunately, I have a form, as you would expect that gives written consent for that agent relationship. I said, so if we can provide, if you'll acknowledge and provide that written consent in a form that you're in fact a client and written consent for any relationship, if you'll do that, then we move forward. She said, as long as it's not a buyer rep agreement, I'll be happy to. She was digging in because our agent had given her the wrong information, state law as opposed to what well, our policy is, here's what we'd like to do. So in that particular situation, she was already a client, you now had to had to give written consent for any new relationship we did on a form that was not the buyer rep agreement. We worked through that. Follow up question. No, I think you just got finished saying that uh, it, the buyer is representing her as a client, so it's no longer sub agents. Yeah, if you've got a buyer client, there is no sub agency. Because no. remember, you you cannot have a situation. This is, how you, this is how you brown belt. He's got some good stuff on here. That's, That's how you brown belt. The X floor. Though. Yes. yes. Yeah. So the key is, if you, so because, do we have a, a semi sense and maybe zoomers of what sub agency is? So you understand why we do not do it in any marketplace where you have both buyer rep, you know, buyer clients and seller clients, whatever, we could not do it. Because we have listings, we have buyer client, sub agent cannot exist. And you're not automatically a sub agent listing broker if you don't represent the buyer. And we say, oh, yeah, if you don't represent the buyer, you're automatically represent the seller. No, you don't. Sub agent has to be offered and accepted for it to exist. And we do not offer it, nor do we accept it. That makes semi sense? Yes. Thank you very much for being here. We've run out of time. Now we just need to turn this off. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah.